Good morning, everybody. I'm Thomas Chatterton Williams. I'm a senior fellow at the Arundt Center here and uh, a visiting professor of the humanities. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Wei, and then she's going to deliver her talk, and then we'll do a Q&A, and then open up the, the, the microphone to audience questions. Niobe Wei is a professor of developmental psychology at NYU, the founder of the Project for the Advancement of Our Common Humanity, and creative advisor of Agape and the PI on the Listening Project. She was the president of the Society for Research on Adolescence and received her BA from UC Berkeley, her doctorate from Harvard, and was an NIMH postdoctoral fellow at Yale. Dr. Wei's work focuses on social and emotional development, how cultural ideologies shape families and child development in the US and China, and on how to build a more just and humane world. The Listening Project is a school-based curriculum that was created to address the global crisis of connection by fostering the practice of listening with curiosity in schools, workplaces, and homes. She has co-authored or authored nearly 100 journal articles and books, including Deep Secrets, Boys Friendships, and The Crisis of Connection, which was the inspiration for Close, a movie that won the Grand Prix Award at the Cannes Film Festival and was nominated for an Oscar for Best Foreign Film. Please welcome Dr. Niobe Wei. Okay. So thank you, first of all. I'm so excited to be here. I can't stand it. I've been looking forward to this ever since I got the invitation. So I can't believe it's actually happening. Um, and I'll tell you why I was so excited. So first of all, I'm so thrilled that Roger just gave that talk before me because it, I, it flows. Roger, what you just said flows what I'm about to say, which I'm sure you predicted. Um, so I started the Project for the Advancement of Our Common Humanity in 2013 in New York uh, because of what Roger just said, is that what I recognize is that when I say common humanity, I don't mean the stupid kind of let's all hold hands. I mean the recognition that if, once you understand that, that we share something similar, which is essentially a desire for friendship, we can understand our, and work through our differences, even continuing to disagree. So when I say common humanity, that's the stance I'm taking very similar to what, Roger, would you agree that's similar to what you're saying? So I'm gonna talk today about, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about why I'm excited to be here, because it relates to what I'm about to say. So I'm a daughter of a, of a, a professor, of course, um, and he was a, a complet professor and a classics professor, uh, focusing on the Western and the Eastern traditions. He was one of those old fashioned comp lit people. Um, and he, he taught me since I was a little girl that everything goes back to Aristotle or Confucius. So I learned that since I was about four. <laughs> so being asked to a, a philosophy conference was exciting. Uh, and he taught in, uh, this relates to what I'm about to teach you. Um, that he taught in Nanjing, China for about nine years in the 80s. He taught Greek, Greek and Latin in China. Uh, I was also married to a person named uh, Ulrich Bayer, who's a complet professor at NYU. Um, and he's been fascinated by Hannah Arendt um, and did a beautiful interview with Richard Bernstein. Richard Bernstein? Right, Richard Bernstein on ha Hannah Arendt. And I uh, encourage you to listen to it. Um, so I've been shaped by, I've been hearing these themes of Hannah Arendt. I've been, he been shaped by it in my work, but definitely on the theme of friendships. And of course, the, most re the reason I'm most excited is that it's a, it's a, it's a topic of what I've been studying since the late 1980s. 1980s. I started investigating friendships in the late 1980s, and let me tell you why. So to have a conference all on this topic I've been thinking about for almost 40 years now, um, is I was a counselor when I was a high school, when I was a doctoral student at Harvard in the late 80s. I was a counselor in a high school, and I was working with kids, primarily kids of color from working class communities, and I uh, would listen to them in, day in and day out as a counselor. Um, and what they were almost all talking about, especially those who identified as boys, um, were talking about their friendships constantly. The desire for friendships, struggling in friendships, wanting to find close friendships, the betrayal in friendships with other guys. That, that's all they were talking about with me. They wanted to work it out. They wanted to figure it out. This was the late 1980s, okay? I was struck by, in my adolescent development class at Harvard, there was not only no discussion of friendships whatsoever, there was only peer relationships when peers are bad because they make you smoke or take drugs, that was the, what we were taught, um, which they do, but that's okay. Um, and, uh, and the other thing was that 
there was no friendships, and there was certainly no notion of boys having something to offer around friendships. So the idea that boys had friendships, I, I still get this comment, that must be a short book, uh, because that, what could they offer us about understanding friendships? So I became fascinated by why in my field of human development, that's my field, um, there was no discussion of friendships. And to this day, Roger, I don't know if you know this, to this day, it is still pretty much missing from the field of developmental psychology. We look at peers. Sometimes we look at friendships in a quantitative way, in a survey way. But studies that really look at the experience of friendship is still incredibly rare in the study of human development. And I want that to give you the chills when I say that, because it's stunning that it's at the core of our humanity, and yet we still don't take it seriously. So today I'm going to tell you a story. Um, I'm going to tell you a story that picks up from a Western tradition of platonic love as well as from the Western tradition of, a, of American masculinity that's now been globalized around the world, and from the Eastern tradition, which is the yin-yang, the need for the yin-yang in a thriving hum humanity, um, and the fact that how ma American masculinity gets in, in, in uh, basically uh, destroys the yin-yang balance. So I'm going to be drawing from the narratives of boys, uh, what they taught us, what they've taught us over many, many decades. Um, these are mostly boys of color, mostly coming from poor and working class communities. And they have taught us a story about the crisis of friendship. I didn't move my first slide, I forgot. They've taught us about the crisis of friendships, its roots, consequences, and solutions. And they've been basically shouting this message on the top of the mountain for a long time. And the culture at large, and I'll talk about what I mean by culture, the culture at large has just not been listening. Um, so I want to repeat the story once again, as I've been doing for many years, um, and then get the response and engage in conversation with uh, Thomas. So let's start. Um, the way I tell this story, the story that I'm about to tell today is in Deep Secrets, and I appreciate it for those of you who have read the book, and you'll already know these quotes if you've read the book, um, uh, and, or if you've seen the movie close. Um, but it's, it's a, a studies I've done over many years. It includes hundreds of boys uh, and young men. Now it's all around the world. It's, it, this book is an American book, but it's now boys from all around the world. Um, and they tell us a story. And I want to point out, and it's a very important distinction for me to, to make. I'm not uh, this is not a talk about boys and young men. Okay? It's a talk about what they have taught us about ourselves and the culture in which we live and why we have a crisis of, of friendships and what I'm gonna call crisis of connection more broadly. So it's not, what, it's not about them, it's what they've taught us. And so if you reimagine how we think about the paradigm of who teaches whom, I'm saying it's the teenagers that have taught us something important about who we are and, what, and why we're in the mess we're in at the moment. Okay. Um, the, I also wrote a book called The Crisis of Connection. That was more recent. That's the broader, I'll use the crisis of friendships and the crisis of connection interchangeably a lot. Uh, because essentially the crisis of connection is the crisis of friendships. And when I say connection, I don't mean just to other people, I mean to self. What we know, we're disconnected from what we know about ourselves, about our desire for friendship. Okay. Um, there was a film, a um, documentary film that came out on the, on the thesis of the book of Deep Secrets called The Masculine, and I recommend you watch it. It's a beautiful film about American masculinity. Uh, it's on Amazon Prime and probably other forums. And then, of course, some of you saw Close. And close is what I call, a, I, I, I deal in words. Uh, Lucas Daunt, who made the film, deals in vi physical images. And so he tells the story physically, and I tell it through words. It's the same story. OK. We're going to start. OK, so in my, my method, for those of you who uh, don't know much about social science research, my method is mixed method. I do interview, lots of interviews, in-depth interviews. And because I'm a developmental psychologist, I follow the same teenagers over time. So, right, so I'll, talk, I'll, follow, I'll start with Michael when he's 12, and I'll follow him year after year after year for five, six, seven years. And so what I'm about to tell you is what happens during adolescence, and adolescence is teenagers, essentially from 12 years old till about 20, okay? So I'm gonna tell you about a story of what happens to friendships according to these young men we've been, I've been interviewing for many, many decades, okay. Uh, there's four themes, and I'm going to walk through the story of it through their words. I don't tell the words through my words, I tell it through their words. So the desire for deep secret friendships, EA means it's, this is a primarily theme in early adolescence. So you're talking about 12, 13, 14, this is the kinds of themes I hear in early adolescence. Uh, then you hear this theme of friendship and mental health. 
early adolescence predominantly, and it made me think in that Love and St. Augustine book when they talk about desire is always riddled with fear, you'll hear it in this. It's amazing. It's exactly the same thing that Hannah Arendt talked about. Then the crisis of connection. This happens, we start to hear this crisis of connection in middle to late adolescence. The MLA is not an organization. It means middle to late adolescence. Um, and, uh, and then how norms of masculinity get in the way of our capacity to connect. And I'm going to make the link, and I'm hope someone, uh, I hope your dean over here, where, I don't know where she's sitting, um, will remind me to link this. This is, again, I want to remind you, this is not about boys and men. This is about all of us sitting in this room and everybody in the world. Okay. Now let's listen to the boys. And what I'd like you to do is actually not take notes. I, and sometimes people even shut their eyes, because I'm just going to read quotes, and I want you to hear the story. I want you to hear the story the boys are telling us. So if you want to just put your notes down, shut your eyes, and listen, I'll talk. And I think I'm going to, uh, Thomas, I'm going to use the microphone. So if you can pull them out, yeah. I, 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 my eyesight is not great, so I'm going to come closer. OK, so we're going to start with, um, we're going to start with this one. Now? Yeah. Okay. So the quotes I'm going to read um, are from different, different people. So I'm not, I'm not just reading from the same person. Um, they're di from different people. And again, I want to remind you of the, of the age they are because it's important to the story. So these are all, again, 13, 14, 15, around there. Um, and these are boys from all different ethnicity, races, um, Asian American, black, brown, white. Uh, I have a whole sort of range because it's public schools in Boston the most part, and you get OK. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so that was the problem. I t I, I'm Italian, so. OK. Um, uh, the first theme, uh, I'm just going to read. Uh, when I asked about friendships, these are questions. The prompt is, say, the interviewer will say, tell me about your friendships. That's the question. OK, tell me about your fr friendships. This is a 13-year-old person. My best friend and I love each other. That's it. You have this thing that is deep, so deep, it's within you. You can't explain it. It's just a thing that you know that that person is that person, and that is all that should be important in our friendship. I guess in life, sometimes two people can really, really understand each other and really have a trust, respect, and love for each other. It just happens. It's human nature. OK, and, and I want to I say a little bit about that quote, because I want you to pay attention to the fact that it just happens it's human nature. That's a 13-year-old kid. All 13-year-olds know that, that it's human nature to love another person and, that that, and to want that. I've got two best friends, Willie and Brian. Like, sometimes when me and Willie argue, me and Brian are real close. Like, then we, when me and Brian are not doing so good, me and Willie are real close. It's like circles of love. Sometimes we're all close. My ideal best friend is a close, close friend who I could say anything to. Because sometimes you need to spill your heart out to somebody, and if there's nobody there, then you're going to keep it inside. Then you'll have anger. So you need somebody to talk to always. And I want to draw attention to these quotes, not only as what they're saying about friendships, but also the extraordinary emotional and relational intelligence revealed in the way they talk about them. So it's not just that they're revealing emotions. Um, it's, it's actually the way you, know, you need someone to talk to because otherwise you'll have anger inside. They get the whole story that you have to take graduate level courses on in psychology. Like they get that already. They got that. They don't need to be taught it. OK. Uh, my best friend and I could just tell me, sorry, let's start again. My best friend could just tell me anything, and I could tell him anything. Him. Like I always know about everything about him. We always chill. Like we don't hide secrets from each other, we tell each other our problems. If I'm another person. If I'm having problems at home, they'll like counsel me. I just trust them with anything, like deep secrets, anything. It's like a bond. We keep secrets. Like if there's something that's important to me, like I could go tell him and he won't go make fun of it. Like if my family is having problems or something. And this is a key one because this was a I heard that I've heard this for, for decades. The capacity in a relationship to be vulnerable without being laughed at. And teenage boys, that's the number one thing they tell me for all you teenagers in the room, um, is that they want to be able to have a friendship with another guy in which they can share something and they are not, it's not turned into a joke. And so even though, <laughs> you know, they say they don't mind the jokes, because that's what 
all the kids I say who come into my house with my son, uh, the reality is when you get them one-on-one, -on -one, this is what they tell you. Okay. Yeah, because my best friend is like a second person you could speak to. It's like how the kids carry a little teddy bear or whatever, and when they cry, they'll hold it and stuff. So when like you get upset or something, you just walk over to your closest friends, and they'll like loosen, they'll like loosen up, whatever. They'll be like, yeah, it's all right, even though it's not. You get, you get the nuance there that's impre I mean, th th these are kids, they understand the relational world deeply, deeply. Um, you know, these are 13, 12, 13, 14 year old kids saying things that pr really reflect our humanity in the most deepest sense, the way we cover over our feelings and pretend it's okay when it's not. Okay, and this is the last one on this theme. I mean, I can like joke around with my friends who are not close and like if I'm having trouble in my classes, like if somebody knows the subject better than me, like I'll ask them. Like, yeah, it's pretty much like that, not too deep though. I wouldn't tell them like my two secretest things, not too secretive. Yeah, like about a girl or something. Um, I mean, that's the deepest, nothing deeper than that though. With my best friends, I will tell them my deepest secrets. And so deepest secrets were almost always, <laughs> you, we could ask the teenagers in the room <laughs> what the deepest secrets are. But what, what, we, uh, what we learn from the research is that deepest secrets are almost always family related issues. Um, that they want to be able to process family related issues, not with their family. Um, and so they want friends to be able to do that. That's usually what they share with us. Okay, the second theme is this pervasive uh, fear that came along with those narratives. And it's reflected, which I just discovered in Hannah, what Hannah Arendt talks about. And it really matches exactly what the boys did. These are the same age, oftentimes the same interviews. Okay, so they, these is when they're talking about their desire and at the same time their fear comes out. Their desire and fear go one on one. You need this. The question was: You always have to. Sh you should always know the question because you can't understand an answer if you don't know the question. Um, why are friends important to you? You need friends to talk to someone. Like you know, you like nobody to talk to. You don't have a friend. It's hard. You got to keep things bottled up inside. You might just start crying or whatever. Someone to talk to. Like you have problems with something. You go talk to him. You know, if you keep it all to yourself, you go crazy. Try to take it out on somebody else. Without friends, you'd go crazy or mad. You'd be lonely all the time. You'd be depressed. You'd go wacko. My friendships are important because you need a friend or else you'd be depressed. You won't be happy. You'd try to kill yourself because then you'd be all alone and no one to talk to. And not only do I hear the, oops, I got one more on this. Okay, one more. Victor, Asian American kid, and I say that because I'm always trying to bust stereotypes about people. And so I want you to understand that a lot of these things are from all kids from all different ethnicities, including, of course, uh, Asian American kids. Victor, if you don't have friends, no, you got no one to tell secrets to, interviewer says. And so what happens then? Victor says, then it's like you need to keep all your secrets to yourself. What do you think it'd be like if you didn't have somebody? Then it's like, I always think like bad stuff in my brain because like no one's helping me and I just need to keep my secrets all to myself. And this theme that you hear, I, I, I work with NYU students, I teach, I teach 100 NYU students a semester. I've been hearing this for decades and decades and decades. The, import, the fact that mental, I'm gonna say this to all, this all to all the young people in the audience. Mental health is not the problem. It's the symptom of a problem, of a crisis of connection. So when we treat mental health as a problem, right, as the problem, our solution is therapy and medication. When we understand it as a crisis of connection, we treat that we try to figure out how to build connection. So I want you to, I see two people smiling in the audience back there. Um, and so I want you to pay attention to that because that, that is critical that these boys teach us that and this is the stuff you already know. If you're under 25, you already know this stuff. Um, but, the idea, but the idea is that that's critical because our dialogue and our cultural dialogue is all about a mental health crisis. And we're not seeing that it's actually rooted in a crisis of connection. Okay, let's go on. So then as boys got older, you started to hear a very different voice. It was a very, very different voice. Um, you started to hear a much more defensive, a sort of whatever, it doesn't matter, I don't care voice. Sometimes you heard a vulnerable voice, but the love voice that you heard earlier started to fade away. And I'll talk about why, that, why we think that is the case. So the question is, do you have a closer best friend this year? Not really, I think myself. The friend I had, I lost it. That was the only person that I could trust and we talked about everything. When I was down, he used to help me feel better. The same I did to him. So I feel pretty lonely and sometimes depressed because I think it will never be the same, you know. I think that when you have a real friend and you lost it, I don't think you find another one like him. I tried to look for a person, you know, but it's not that easy. 
And remember, these are the same boys that three years earlier had said, I love him so much, I can't live without him. And now there's a distance. Another kid says, no, I don't say I do because I feel like a friend is going to be there for you and he'll support you whether they're good and bad times you can share with him. You can share your feelings with him, your true feelings. That's why I don't think I have any real close friends. I hate it anymore. I hate it. I hate it because I wouldn't mind talking to somebody my age that I can relate to them on a different basis. And finally, do you have a close friend or best friend this year? Remember, again, it's, this is all many, many years in. This is like fourth, fourth year interview. Like my friendship with my best friend is fading, but I'm saying it's still there. But, so I mean it's still there because we'd still do stuff together, but only once in a while. It's sad because he lives only one block away from me and I get to do stuff with him less than I get to do stuff with people who are way further. So I'm like, yo, it's like a DJ used his crossfader and started fading it slowly and slowly. And now I'm like halfway through the crossfade. I mean, come on. Can you just appreciate the language there? Like that is just, it's just so, Humans are so articulate. Um, we used to be like close, as far as always being around each other. It's just we're apart, like as far as like if I need them, they'll still be there if they need me, I'll be there. But as far as like always being together, we're not as close as we were before. Okay, and let me just, yeah, this is the last one. Okay, 20, okay, great. Um, can I have a sip of water? I was very excited to come, so now I'm all parched. I'll, I'll drink when I finish. Okay, so the question is, do you have a closer best friend uh, this year? Not really, I think myself. The friend I had, I lost it. That was the only person that I could trust and we talked about everything. When I was down, he used to help me feel better. The same I did to him. So I feel pretty lonely and sometimes depressed because I have no one to go out with, no one to tell my secrets or to help me solve my problems. What don't you think, why don't you think you have someone? Because I think it will never be the same, you know. I think that when you have a real friend and you lost it, I don't think you find another one like him. That's the point of view I have. I tried to look for a person, but you know it's not that easy. Okay, okay so the, four, the fourth thing we heard is um, what the language of the boys as they got older, they started to be infused with what I would call and it, what is homophobic language. So you started to hear the no homo going on. You didn't hear it in early adolescence. You started to hear the no homo. And then the kind of weird response that you would get when you asked about friendships, guys would say sometimes, I'm not gay. Why are you asking me that question? And I'm, I'd say, well, no, we're not interested in your sexuality. We're interested in actually your friendships. And they said, well, just as long as you know, I'm not gay. So the equation of, uh, of, of a sexuality with friendships, began, we began to hear that theme in late adolescence. Um, we still hear a version of it. It doesn't sound like that's so gay anymore because that's a little bit old dated at this point. But you still get it all the time. And this notion of a human need being now equated with a sexuality that is, by the way, a late 20th century uh, phenomenon. Okay, so, but you do hear masculine ideologies in their quotes. So, I don't need to express my feelings anymore. I am mature, I am a man. Meaning, feelings are expressed with, <laughs> this is the crazy thing, we live in a crazy culture. We have gendered thinking and feeling. So thinking is masculine and feeling is feminine. And we put feminine on the bottom and masculine on the top. So we have, uh, we have gendered core human capacities and needs. And so to grow up and to mature, even in developmental psychology, mature, it means to man up. Man up and maturing, it means the same thing in, our, in American culture. Okay, it might be nice to be a girl because then you wouldn't have to be emotionless. I mean, that, if that doesn't give all the adults in the room <laughs> the chills, I don't know what does. Because then you wouldn't have to be emotionless? Like, excuse me? And then, of course, you got a lot of this. No homo, me and my friends still hang out, but no homo. So again, I'm, I'm pointing out this sort of the way right, misogyny and homophobia it gets infused in these dialogues. Okay, so they tell us this story of the crisis of friendships, the roots of the crisis, the consequences of the crisis, of the culture nature clash and the solutions. And I'm gonna walk it through, and then I'm gonna tell you a different story that's gonna be only about five minutes, and then we'll sit down and talk to Thomas. Okay, so they teach us about the crisis of friendships, and I'm calling it, as I said before, the crisis of connection, uh, because that's the broader phenomenon. Um, and they teach us about the roots. And what they teach us in their narratives over time 
is that the way in which we have privileged our masculine sides over our feminine sides. And I'll read through each of them because each of them I know is true, <laughs> that we, we actually do privilege this. And my NYU students uh, certainly validate that again and again. Thinking over feelings, stoicism over vulnerability, the me over the we, romantic relationships over friendships. We still have the label single to identify ourselves when that's all in relation to our romantic relationship. We should get rid of that entirely. Uh, numbers over words, money over love, intellectual curiosity over interpersonal curiosity. We don't even study interpersonal curiosity in human development because we equate it with gossip. Even though we spend about 80% of our lives thinking about the thoughts and feelings of other people, we don't see it as a serious topic. We see it as a soft topic, and, and thus we don't study it. So intellectual curiosity is considered important and not, and not uh, interpersonal. Humans, however, have their hard and soft sides, and that's what I'm saying, the yin and the yang. The whole essence of the yin and the yang from Chinese philosophy is that we have both sides of ours make us human, the hard and the soft, right? And so if we have a, a culture, that, which we have now, that emphasizes only the yang, which is the hard side of ourselves, right? Only the yang is, is, is emphasized, the masculine side. Um, and the yin is, is not only not valued, but actually mocked and teased and demeaned and seen as less important and, 80% of parents in the United States think academic achievement is more important than kindness. Uh, so we're definitely living in a hard society. The consequences of this culture-nature clash, right? It's a culture-nature clash. We are fully human. We have hard and soft. We have half of our humanities, the hard and the soft, come together to make us human. Um, and the, when we clash, it creates a crisis of connection. The depression, anxiety, loneliness, suicide, and all forms of violence are a product of this disconnection from ourselves and disconnection from others that leads to disconnection from others. So the, the, the soaring rates of depression, we're having soaring rates of all of this. The suicide rates are off the charts, particularly for boys and men. And by the way, particularly for black boys and men, by the way. Okay, and then the solutions to the crisis is disrupt this culturally enforced hierarchy by valuing both sides of our humanity, the hard and the soft, and all types of uh, relationships, particularly friendships. Okay, I'm gonna walk you through something very quickly because uh, I wanna get in conversation with uh, Thomas about this. What's very interesting is, so I was listening to boys since the late 80s. This is the story. I've been listening, I've been listening to teenagers, I've been listening to girls too, non-gender conforming kids as well. Um, but the story was really coming out of listening to the, those identified as boys and young men. And I was hearing the story that they were teaching us about the crisis of connection, the roots, consequences, and solutions. They were teaching us this. And then I started reading the broader body of science, social neuroscience, sociology, uh, social psychology, anthropology, evolutionary theory, one person in that. Um, and they started to, I started to realize they're telling the same story. They're telling the same stories the boys told us. Exact same story, it's exactly the same story. So I wanna walk it through because it's stunning. Uh, over a century of science has been saying the same story the boys are saying. So what we're finding is a, we're seeing a paradigm shift in the sciences where we're now becoming fascinated by our social nature. Um, the fundamental assumption now of people who study human nature uh, from the scientific perspective is that humans need close relationships and we are remarkably skilled at having them. Um, Franz Duval, a primatologist says, which I love this quote, we involuntarily enter the bodies of those around us so that their movements and emotions echo within us as if they are our own from the very beginning of life. Another one, another social neuroscience says, we are wired to be social. We are driven by deep motivations to stay connected to friends and family. We are naturally curious about what is going on in the minds of other people. We will spend our entire lives motivated by social connection. So that's the boys saying I want friendships, right? That's the equivalent. Okay, second part. This is the boys saying no homo and all those kinds of things. We get this in the sociology, we get this in all sorts of literatures, education literature as well. Cultural ide ideology is premised on a hierarchy of humans and human qualities, the hard over the soft, whether that's patriarchy, capitalism, white supremacy, heteronormativity, they all have the same hierarchy of humans and human qualities, right? It's all about who's more human than other humans. That literally clashes with our nature as humans and then leads to a crisis of connection. So this hierarchy is actually implicit in, in our hate ideologies, and that leads to literally our crisis of friendships, is that we've made this hierarchy of humans and human qualities. Um, and evidence of that in the social neuroscience is infant brains are so malleable that what begin as small differences at birth become amplified over time as parents and teachers and the culture at large unwittingly re reinforce gender stereotypes, and of course I could say racial stereotypes and all sorts of types of stereotypes. 
culture is, right, reinforces that. The third part of the story, which the boys told us in the crisis of connection, their own crisis of connection, you see this around the world. Uh, you know, our, our Surgeon General now is saying that loneliness is our number one public health crisis in the, in the, in the country. Um, so you see all sorts of elements of the, the crisis of connection. And then finally, the consequences, you see it everywhere. That those under 25 are now called the mass shooter generation. Um, I've done an analysis of many, many manifestos from mass shooters. They tell the same story I'm telling you today. It's just they're more isolated. Uh, but they tell the exact same story I'm telling you today. Okay, the solution, this is the, one more minute. Am I good? Okay, okay, good. Um, the solution to the crisis is something, so how do you disrupt the hierarchy of humanness and human qualities? That sounds like a big lift, it's not. Because guess why it's not a big lift? Can someone tell me? Why is d disrupting that hierarchy not a big lift? Someone just, exactly. Because we're born with it. We're born with it, it's natural, it's natural. Our five-year-old selves are the most brilliant selves. We ask questions all the time. Listen to those five-year-old questions, they're almost always brilliant. Five-year-olds ask questions like, mommy, why are you crying? Why are you smiling when you're feeling sad? Meaning, why do you fake an emotion? They also ask questions like, mommy, are you yelling at me because your mommy yelled at you? I mean, come on, that's a graduate level course, right? So the idea is we are born effing brilliant, right? Unbelievably brilliant in terms of understanding the emotional and relational worlds. And then we grow up and become less intelligent, right? Because we begin to shut down half of our humanity and we become dumb, or less intelligent. I don't like the word dumb. Okay, um, so the, the solution is a project that we've been doing in the schools, and I can talk about it in the breakout session in, uh, on one o'clock. And I'm not gonna go into it because I wanna get into conversation, but it's essentially, it's essentially, it's a practice that started off as a research methods class for doctoral students in 1995, and the students would say, hey, Niobe, this actually totally transforms my relationships at home. Um, this is more than just a research method. This is actually a way to engage with people. And so it's a method of listening. We call it transformative interviewing, and it's a method of listening with curiosity. It has nine or 10 practices to it that actually helps people build relationships to get to the mechanic. Uh, Phil was, we were talking about Phil, the mechanics of how you build relationships. It doesn't, it's not just bringing people together, right? That doesn't create a connection. It's actually a skill, and we naturally have it, and we have to nurture it. Okay, on that note, I am done. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Um, I'm fascinated by this. I have uh, a ten-year-old daughter and a five-year-old son right now, and oh, okay. uh, and and we're, we're yeah, he's, yeah. It's true that five-year-olds really do yeah. have a kind of innate um, brilliance that gets snuffed out of you yeah, as the yeah, world yeah, yeah, completely. gets its hands around you. But you know, I was thinking about on the most basic level, how do we define friendship? You know, I'm, we're living in. Uh, I'm raising my children mostly in Europe, and my brothers. Um, Ex-wife is Russian, I have a, a half-Russian niece, and I, I'm, I'm surrounded by a lot of people that are not necessarily American and don't take American uh, presuppositions for granted. And one of the things they constantly point out is they're shocked at how quickly Americans say, oh, that's my friend, or meet my friend, or yeah. I've got a friend there. Yeah. And they say, that's crazy, because they barely know that person, that's an acquaintance. Yeah. And, and so what is the threshold First of all, you know, for friendship, yeah. and 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 is there some relation in the superficiality with which Americans throw out that term uh, and the kind of crisis of friendship that we right. seem to be uh, having that other cultures don't? Yeah, yeah, definitely, and I know exactly what you mean. I mean, it's it's interesting, but I I don't I think it reflects. Uh, it's like why we think we want a lot of Facebook or Instagram friends. We think that it makes us. We think by having, calling you a friend, you will become a friend, right? We think by saying you are my friend, even calling you my BFF, we think that that means that therefore we will be close. And that's because, Phil, this is related to our conversation. That is because we think that if we put the language on it, you will have the experience because we don't actually think it's a skill. You get what I'm saying? We don't think there's skill behind it. We think we just label you, Thomas is now my best friend because we're doing this together, and now we're really gonna be, right, it's gonna create an intimacy. It doesn't, and in fact, for most of you, because you probably know this already, it actually makes you feel more alienated when someone calls you a friend or a close friend, and you don't feel it, 
you know, it makes you feel like, uh, okay. Um, so the idea is Americans do that. And the question is, why Americans? And I would say because our American masculinity, that you know how I know it's been globalized? Because Close was made. Close was an, a Belgian film. And it won 110 awards around the world. 110. 110. Yay! <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and it's a brilliant film. But it's drawing from Lucas, the director and screenwriter's own experience. I mean, he read, the, he read my book, Deep Secrets, but it's drawing from his own experience. So, and he said it's a European, it's definitely a European phenomenon, the sort of, as you grow up, it somehow becomes sexualized, and because we're all homophobic, ultimately, it becomes something that's negative, right? So the idea is the teasing, even in, in Germany, you're getting from my nieces and nephews that there's the that's so gay thing that Americans have had, unfortunately, for so long. You're seeing that in German schools. That, that that's so gay. So my guess, it links to this, you know, Americans started this horrible phenomenon <laughs> of fake friendships first. Uh, and, but I think it comes from that we have been inundated with American masculinity for, you know, almost a century at this point in, in that form that makes soft things feminized. Because if you look at the 20th century, you know, letters between men were very soft. <laughs> I mean, the notion that soft somehow is girly and gay um, is a late 20th century phenomenon. It comes after World War II, basically, where we begin to see that equation of soft phenomenon, writing poetry, reading, God help me, uh, right? I mean, all these things that we've now made soft as girly and gay and thus negative in a, in a homophobic, misogynist culture. So the idea is that Americans have been doing it longer, so they're going to be more desperate to try to find friends because they're so disconnected. And so I would say, I'm not saying Europeans, I'm not idealizing Europeans, but I'm just saying that at some level, you know that physicality in close? That felt very European to me, at least from my, what I know about European culture versus American culture. That kind of touching and moving and sleeping together and there was, I mean, just felt very, very of a kind of culture within many European cultures and probably around the world, quite frankly. Uh, but I know the European culture very well. So, so to me, it's, it's like uh, the, fake, the faking it, the faking it is a distinctly American uh, problem. Does that answer your question or not? Really? Partially, uh, but it gets me thinking about other things too. You know, when we say European, I think we're talking more like continental European yeah. cultures. Yeah. And I'm thinking that a lot of American culture is really uh, it's it's fundamentally white Anglo-Saxon Protestant yeah. culture yeah. In, in even yeah. when you talk about other ethnicities that are yeah. shaped in the American yeah. um, um, crucible. And so I think that, you know, when I think about the ways that kids caress in, in France or the way that men kiss uh, when they're when they're close family or friends on yeah. the cheek, yeah. um, I don't think of that as being a British way of interacting. I think of there being a kind of yeah, that's true. a wall yeah. between yeah, men in, in, in English, yeah. British society, and I think that's probably shaped America very much so. Um, yeah, and, and, but, but you also see, so, so yes, yes, yes. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because you also see in the Middle East, I teach in the Abu Dhabi, NYU Abu Dhabi, and there was, when I first started teaching 10 years ago, there was a tradition among those men from the United Arab Emirates that when they greeted each other, they touched each other's noses. Um, so that was the standard way of greeting each other, was through the no touching of the nose. Oh, sorry. When, uh, in, in, in the United Arab Emirates, when men greet each other, people who are local to the area, th 10 years ago when I used to go there, they greet each other by touching each other on the nose. Um, now, I go every year. Now, they do no longer do that. And when I've asked young men why they don't do the touching of the nose, they do the same thing. You know what they say. They say because it suggests that, that you know, it looks gay. So the idea is that, that you see the American masculinity coming in to all cultures, regardless of you know, the cultures in which they were raised, which most of the world was probably raised in a much softer version of reality than for American kids. And then, of course, it varies, as you're alluding to, across American kids. And one question we can talk about, if you want, is that there was variation in my sample. That among the Puerto Rican, Dominican, Asian American, European American, Asian American was mostly Chinese American, um, and, uh, and European American, who do you think were the most resistant to norms of masculinity of those four categories? 
Puerto Rican, Dominican, European American, and Chinese American. Latinos. Yeah, but who, which ones? Uh, Puerto Ricans. Puerto Ricans, totally. Puerto Ricans are off the charts always. My best friend was Puerto Rican growing really? up. Really? Yeah. yeah. No, almost always Puerto Rican kids, they have a clarity about who they are as human in a way that has to be coming from their Puerto Rican culture. Um, and so why did you pick Puerto Ricans? My best friend growing up was half black, half Puerto Rican, and he yeah. had a, a, an ability to be intimate uh, in a way that I, through the, I, I think it was definitely... Um, a mark of the cultural context he grew up in. It wouldn't even be yeah. conceivable to him that he was doing something not masculine. Yeah. And those are really masculine guys also. Yeah. Oftentimes there's no contradiction. Yeah. But as you're talking too, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that, you know, I just was noticing this a couple of weeks ago walking down the street in Paris, two 12, 13-year-old uh, West African kids walking mm -hmm. down the street holding hands. Um, it didn't seem to me romantically inflected at all. Yeah, I see yeah. Middle Eastern men can do that too, but I wouldn't necessarily say that those societies are more yeah. gentle in their yeah. treatment of women <laughs> yeah. or in lots of yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder yeah. to what end does that tenderness actually help anything? Yeah, well, this is, but this is the whole contradiction. We think, we're, we think we're more progressive, we Americans think we're more progressive, but we've never had a woman president. So, I mean, there's all, and we have no, very few women in the Senate. So the idea is that there's all these contradictions, so we think we're the most enlightened of the world. A lot of Americans think that. Um, and in some ways, we are. We talk about race in ways that very few other countries talk about race, um, right? We are enlightened in many different ways. But we have this underlying, you know, we still kill, <laughs> still openly, publicly, police still kill black people. Women still get killed by their husbands all the time in the United States. So the idea is that the contradiction doesn't mean one or the other, right? So you have the contradictions in the Middle East, and certainly you have it in China all the time, is that the holding hands does suggest a softness, but it, does, but, right, but they, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're then enlightened with women. So the idea is that the, the thing to unpack, and we can have this discussion at one o'clock, is why is that happening? Why is that so that men in the Middle East, for example, our friendships between men are, are very much encouraged because they're not, uh, oftentimes they're not allowed to have friendships with women, so that they're very much encouraged with other women. Friendships between men and women in this country are much more encouraged, that's, that's more tolerable in many uh, communities. Um, but it's oftentimes the men, you know, the women supporting the men in that friendship, and it's not necessarily men going to other men. So the, so the idea is to think about how cultural conducts in this way allows for a softness and doesn't allow for another, uh, uh, other types of softness. And, and I think it's a good question for all of us to be thinking about of why that may be variation, right? In terms of no one culture <laughs> has it all, right? No one culture is the enlightened culture. It just doesn't exist. We're all struggling with this tension, but because of capitalism, patriarchy, and white supremacy exist around the world, you have this insistent hierarchy of humanness and human qualities that you see around the world and it's played out in different ways, but I think I wanna capture that similarity, uh, Roger, that you get around the world in the, in the ways in which what's getting in the way of our capacity to connect to each other. Um, yeah, I, you mentioned it in the talk and also in, a, in an interview from 2011 in The New Yorker that I uh, read recently. Um, oh, no, what well, no, it brings me back. The, the, at the time that you were conducting these interviews, the phrase no homo specifically was very much a part of a, a cultural moment. You know, it was coming out of um, like Cameron and the Dipset and this type of yeah. like slang from, from yeah. New York. And I was amazed, you know, just watching that expression balloon out from a kind of micro hip hop culture to like mainstream yeah, white yeah. kids saying it. Yeah. But it also seems to me like that does seem like of that moment and in the intervening decade and change, it seems to me like the world that like my kids are growing up in now is very different than even the world of 2010 and how they think of gender. And I don't think it would cross a lot of younger people's minds to, 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 to qualify statements that way. And uh, especially on a campus like Bard and a lot of liberal arts colleges that I go to, it seems that there's not the kind of fear of um, being understood as queer in the same way. H have things changed in, uh, since, yeah. since these interviews were conducted in certain um, ways? Yeah, no, we remember I still work, I mean, we still work in school, so we're still doing lots of work with schools. So the answer is yes and no. So definitely, 
we're w more willing to acknowledge that other people are gay and that even our own friends may be gay and even our family members. And this is coming directly from the mouths of people of all different identities. Like um, even the big rappers like Jay-Z and even Eminem yeah, now yeah. Has, has, you know, spoken publicly about not being homophobic and yeah. rejecting those types of yeah. views. No, definitely. But when you, but when you think about it, you know, the fact that you're still getting pervasively, and I get this also from raising kids, that that's so gay, um, saying which means, in, as everybody knows, that's so lame, that you're still getting lots of homophobia. And the thing that, what, what seems to be happening is as we progress, it's like the Obama and then the Trump. As we progress, we get backlashes. So what it feels like in the, in the tenor when you listen to young people, and even listening to high school boys in last semester, and they, it sounded, it, they sounded like from the 1950s. I mean, they were talking about masculinity in the most stereotypic way. It was sort of blew my mind. I asked all my NYU students, 100 NYU students, to define masculinity and femininity. I literally thought I was from my mother's generation listening to college students. They were talking about femininity being focused on your looks and being pretty and you know, being vulnerable and masculinity was being independent and smart and assertive. I mean, it was unbelievable that they're still aligning a gender with core human capacity. So to me, you know, and, and softness is equated with being gay and softness is being feminine and it's seen as something lesser than. So to me, yes, we've progressed in many ways, but I think the argument that sort of we've arrived and we're now comfortable with it blinds us, throws acid in our eyes, that we're actually still struggling with a fundamental hierarchy of human and human qualities that's driven through every context that we're in, schooling, right, that's the hard over the soft. And so the idea is until we can actually value both sides of our humanity truly, we'll never have arrived at accepting people who may value the soft more than the hard, or maybe appear to be softer rather than hard. Can you speak a bit more about the, the, the variations you find between class groups, educational groups, ethnic groups yeah. uh, within the American context? Because when I think about my own experience, um, I think that the the luck of friendship has been inflected a lot by my um, going to college. Like a lot of my um, really formative, important adult friendships were yeah. are from undergrad, not from high school or before. Right. And then those become networks of social capital that uh, you know exponentially lead to more friendships. Yeah. And my brother didn't go to college, um, and he has far fewer friends and doesn't actually know where to go out and get them, yeah. whereas it seems to me there's a lot of places you can immediately go and get friends, yeah. and they go back, when I think about it, to um, going to um, an undergraduate college in America. And so I wonder if th some of that comes into play, and, and there's a crisis in American male friendship in the working class and, and places like that that is uh, less emblematic of the upper middle class and how that's inflected by ethnicity? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I would say, I think that there's class differences that you get that I would say if those boys in my study had been all white upper middle class kids, I wouldn't have gotten those themes. Um, because generally you have white boys, pr privileged white boys are the least connected to their common humanity. <laughs> Uh, they're really emphasizing the hard side, which makes sense to you because the closer you are to the center of power, the more you're gonna be focused on the hard side than the soft side. The more you're at the fringes of power, the more you're willing to be hard and soft. So you hear that in the voice. That, that's a very specific finding to poor and working class young men, uh, mostly of color, not all of color, but mostly of color. Um, I do think though, when you look at the loneliness rates and mass shooters, mass shooters are almost all white boy, rich white boys. They're almost all rich white boys. Um, and to me, that's about race and class in there. But the idea is the mass shooters are coming from a space of desperate loneliness. And they write about that in their manifestos. I'm not justifying it. I'm not being sympathetic. I am saying, as Roger would do in his spirit, I am saying that's just a fact. So the fact of the matter is we want to prevent violence. We have to understand why people are committing violence. And they're committing violence because they feel deeply isolated and alone. And you hear that among all races, all ethnicities, all classes in this country. Now, not everybody, right? There's always, there's lots of people who have been able to find positive relationships, lots of them. And in our studies, the boys that were most likely to hold on to their friendships and not go through this crisis is when they had a relationship at home that, in which they could 
uh, basically explore what it is to be close to someone, or with a sibling, or with an uncle, or with somebody in their family, that they could actually explore what it means to feel close on a more in-depth level. And people who had that throughout their lives from a very early age were oftentimes you know, able to hold on. However, I have to say 80% of the kids in my NYU classes say that they are very, very lonely, that they're very lonely and they're looking for close friendships in a meaningful way. That's 80% of my classes. So we are, it is a very, very lonely time at this point. So I have to ask, you know, I always ask, what does the, these boys teach us about why we are so lonely? And I think they teach us something very important. I have one more question, then I'm going to open it up to the audience. Um, you know, I saw the statistic that 15% of adult men have no, say they have no friends. Yeah. And I wonder if, um, if your research has given you an insight onto whether, you know, the, the breakdown of, you know, these kinds of American institutions that used to kind of give you friends, uh, like the church yeah. and things like yeah, this, is, yeah. is impacting that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, so people, probably some of you know, especially the academics know about Bowling Alone. Uh, it's a book that was written about how we've increasingly diminished our community settings to come together and connect, definitely. But again, that is a sort of symptom <laughs> uh, of the basic fundamental thing is that we privilege everything we consider masculine or hard and don't uh, value the things that are considered soft. Going and being in a community is not seen as one of our top things that we need to do in life. Right, we think we need to make a lot of money and have a lot of toys. So the idea is in such a hard, hard culture where it's about cognition over emotion and stoicism over vulnerability. It's not flipping the hierarchy because it's vulnerability isn't more important than stoicism, but about actually valuing that you can be vulnerable through being stoic and vice versa. Uh, the yin yang, right? The yin yang. It's they're working together. Um, then causes us to not value our community organizations, and then we start to not go bowling because we don't value it. We start to want to stay home after COVID rather than actually engaging with other people because we think, and I have to pick on one thing before we go. This also, we have gotta get rid of a couple messages here. When you go through something difficult, how many times have people told you, you should go off and spend time alone to figure out what's going on with you to come to sort of love yourself alone while you go through that hard time? Has anyone had experienced that kind of advice? Okay, yeah, so yeah, I did. <laughs> When I went through the divorce with my ex-husband, the last thing in the world I ever wanted to do was go off and be alone <laughs> while I'm suffering. I got that from my entire family, right? That the thing to do is to go off alone, like the Emerson idea, <laughs> go off alone and discover. That these are dangerous myths because they hurt. They, kill, they ultimately kill some of us, right? This notion that you should go off alone and discover yourself rather than actually find deeply connected relationships that can help you move through a difficult time. So I just want to think about, I want you to all think about how much this message of the me, me, me and the individual, and it's all about the individual, pervades your thinking, pervades your thinking. Um, and if we start from a new place, if we start from the we, if we start from the relational space, self in relationship, independence and relation in relationships, autonomy in relationships, then we come to a much healthier space. But we have to be willing to start from a very, very different place than we've been starting with. Do, do all the young people know what I mean by starting place? I mean, your basic assumptions that you come into the world with, I want you to challenge them to understand that there's a problem that we value academic achievement over kindness. That should shock you, that most parents in this country value academic achievement over kindness when kindness is obviously fundamental to our humanity. Yeah. Thank you. Um, does anyone have a... <laughs> well, Kylan has a microphone. I think you were in this area, you were first. I just, oh, thank you very much. It was fantastically illuminating, and uh, I'm speaking as a, a psychoanalyst, but I was, I was just um, thinking of de Tocqueville's and how back in the oh, 18th century yeah. we're talking about yeah. American hyper, hyper individual, oh my God. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as a, so as, as a psychoanalyst, uh, but I was thinking about um, the hyper individualism that's so valued in this country that 
he wrote about even then. So we had this yeah. ideal of the uh, lonely man against, you know, against the wilderness and uh, how that's pervaded uh, this, the cowboy. The, yeah, yeah, the uh, cowboy mentality, which I, and, I got, um, I got skewered I, on, I, by the way. As, so I've, I, I'm going to jump, on, since I haven't thought it through, to our, our sense of um, friendship as mutual participation in the satisfaction, perhaps, of, in, of need, of mutual needs. You get the extreme of the army oneness kind of friendship, which is maybe not even a friendship because people aren't defined as individuals. But uh, oh no, it is but a isn't, doesn't yeah. Hannah uh, Arendt write about how the lack or, or paucity of civil spaces to bring people of all genders, all, all ages, together to participate from the earliest age to be on teams of mutative experiences were outward bound or desegregated classes. Yeah. Oh my God, everybody's the same. Uh, we didn't. We have so few civil spaces to interact here. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, but I, I think, that, and de Tocqueville is an important one uh, because I think that the, what what I would say the 20th century thinkers, because a lot of people have talked about individualism, a lot of people have, a lot of thinkers have throughout the 20th century, and criticized our individualistic f focus. If you don't see that it's a product of the way of the patriarchal gendering <laughs> of masculinity over femininity and individualism is masculinized. You don't see the root of the problem of why we're so, ma why we're so individualized, focused. So you gotta name the politics, right? The politics of it, which is that it's embedded in a patriarchal framework that privileges all things masculine, we've deemed masculine, over all things feminine. And when you don't name it, you're then blinded to it. So then you just say, well, we're individuals of the culture. I guess it came from, who knows what it came from? It came from who, you know, the, the, the nature of this history of this country. No, no, it came from a very distinct ideology, right? That's not just about individuals over relationships. It is about everything that we've deemed masculine privileged over everything that we've deemed soft and feminine. And that ride, and it affects everybody regardless of even being, right, from different cultures that don't believe in that. I get Indian students oftentimes telling me, you know, I didn't know what you, what you're saying is how I was raised in different cities in India. Uh, I didn't know that was a normal way to think, right? Like that's, that's a powerful thing to say, meaning the way I'm talking. He said, I didn't know that was, no even though I was raised that way, I didn't know that was a normal way to think. He thought that his, his experience was somehow abnormal. And I get that a lot, that sense that somehow their experience of being abnormal. Anyways, I'm, I'm shifting a little bit, but I do think that whole notion of yeah, we don't value the community. We don't value coming together. I mean, we don't, we don't see that as the, the whole purpose in life should be how to build we, all we want. Okay, I just got to say this one thing because I have this beautiful audience. All we want is each other. That's all. That's all we want. So how do we create spaces in which we nurture that capacity to stay connected to ourselves, which is our desire to then connect with other people? That should be the focus of everything we do. Work, school, home, raising, I don't care what it is. Just that. How do we do that? How do we nurture that human capacity to do it? Okay. All the way up there in the back left, in the suit. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joshua Spivey. I'm a dean of students um, for college. Um, ages year one and year two at Bar DC. My question was, um, you brought up family related issues and right now I'm finishing my dissertation about students that are in K through 12 education that uh, experience loss of a parent and how you navigate that space to get to college. And I found out one of the spaces that they utilize are barbershops, mm. specifically black barbershops. Mm. And I realized that they use that as a space of yeah. um, friendship and politics, right? So I was wondering, have you found out anything about the, even in the, even in yeah, the late yeah. 1980s and early 90s, did you find that students saw that as a space of relief going to area um, hair salons or barbershops? Yeah, and, and by the way, when I, when I refer to the 1980s, I'm saying, you know, since the 1980s, but all the way up forward. But yeah, definitely, there were many more spaces. Barbershops are, have always been uh, fascinating places because they definitely are spaces of connection deep connection, um, and so absolutely yes. There's also lots of other spaces. Sports teams, when, when they have a good coach, when they have a good coach, um, sports teams can be an amazing space for building deep connection when the coach knows what they're doing. 
okay, in terms of building the human connection. I'm oftentimes consulting with soccer coaches uh, because they get that they can play a huge role. Teachers, teachers that can create beautiful relational spaces in the classroom where that becomes a really special place for young people. And I hate to say this because I know it's gonna go against a lot of people's beliefs um, around the military, but what I hear from veterans and people in the military is that that part of why they join the military, you know what I'm gonna say, is to build connection with other people and to have a community. Um, and so the idea is the military is also, I've been told, is a very positive space for building deep and meaningful connections with each other. There's other groups though, when you don't provide opportunities, there's incel movements, there's the Ku Klux Klan, there's lots of movements right, where, bo where people come together to hate on other people because there's no alternatives. So you have to be thinking about the necessity for barbershops and other places to really bring people in who are starving for connection because they will sometimes, if they're very isolated, turn to hate groups as a way to form connection. Let's see, right in the center. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, you, yeah, with the glasses. Yeah. 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 I mean, I I get that question. Oh yeah. So basically, what are some suggestions of, of possibilities of ways for people of different identities to form connect, right? Is that what you're asking? To form connection. And I do have to agree with you. I've been told this by my Gen Z son, um, that, uh, that your generation, Gen Z generation, is making a kind of progress in these discussions that the older generations have not been. So I, I, I'm agreeing with you on that one. Now in terms of um, all, you know, offering spaces, I don't have concrete things. All I know is that people are creating all sorts of beautiful connected spaces and we need to value them, right? <laughs> so we need to even as a university to the dean in here, we need to fund them if they're campus based so that, that we can encourage them to have, you know, pizzas together or whatever it is. We need to find it. They're, they're, na they're bubbling up because it's natural to us, right? They're bubbling up because it's natural to us. And then value them value that. I mean, I spent four years with my daughter telling her, asking her, did she do her homework, right? Rather than about what she wanted to talk about with her, with her friendships. So it's actually valuing it is to me the answer. So find it and then, right, you gotta value it. Okay, um, maybe this is the last one right here in the green cap. Um. Actually, I have a different point, but just about barber shops. I remember I, raised, I was raised in a small uh, southern community, mm -hmm. and I went to get a haircut from the local barber, and he refused to give it to me mm -hmm. because he said, you are about to have your uh, senior photograph in your yearbook, and I don't think you want that. <laughs> so that's just kind of an anecdote yeah. about how <laughs> culture the barbershop culture comes in. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, What I'm really interested in is something you just very briefly kind of illustrated, and that is the physical interaction between, especially, well, let's talk about boys. Yeah. When they're preteens, everything is physical as well as all these other things yeah. you pointed out. And it seems to be lost as they get into teenhood. Yeah. And this, I kind of interpret this thing that you talked about, about the fear of homosexuality. Both, I see the influence of cultural stereotypes, 
But I also hear underneath of that the fear of the need for continuing the physical interactions yeah. that are so important. Yeah, and, and I would say, and this is, I'm glad you are asking the question, because I also want to remember, you remember I'm not just talking about boys, for people who identify as boys. I'm talking about everybody. So girls and boys and non-gender conforming kids, all people, all humans, have these desires for physicality and for emotional expression and for closeness. Um, and why boys, people who identify as boys, are struggling in particular, men included, is that we have pushed that hard soft even more on them than other people. Um, however, in China, in our China data, because we do studies across China, we've done a 20 year longitudinal study with uh, 1,000 families, is that Chinese girls are now more likely to adhere to norms of masculinity than Chinese boys, because they got the message that if you adhere, guess what? Doors open. Doors open. And I want to do a shout out to women in leadership, uh, the class. Who for, uh, who's in women in leadership class? Okay, good, good. Uh, because this has all to do with how we train leaders. That leaders, leadership needs to be the inclusive of the hard and the soft. That's a good leader. To nourish your capacity to be stoic and your, when appropriate, to be vulnerable in allowing someone else's stoicism, right? Or whatever it is. So this is relevant to everybody, right, in terms of what this masculine uh, uh, framework is. I had a young woman the other day say to me, um, I said, girls are pressured to, to be more stereotypically feminine boys. And she said, uh-uh. <laughs> she said, girls have to look like girls and act like boys. She said, that's just the way it is. Um, and so the idea on the hookup culture, I'm going to say it to all you guys in the back rows, the hookup culture is total masculinity. It's, it's about not caring about relationships and you know, we're just wanting sex. I mean, that's all part of the hard soft. And the de desire for actual real relationships becomes soft and kind of lame. Needy, I'm gonna say another thing to the people who identify as, uh, as on the more feminine side. There's no such thing as being overly sensitive. Humans are sensitive, we're all sensitive. There's no such thing as overly sensitive. Don't let anyone tell you you're overly sensitive because that's just being human. Um, I think that's uh, that's our time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, yeah, Dr. Way.